welcome to Poetry at the Canal on this lovely day. It's a delight to see everybody crowded in here and out on the balcony, we've got the poets. So this is Chichester Poetry and uh, we're pleased to kick off with our very first poet, the man on the guitar from Little Machine and a fine poet in his own right, Key to the Highway is his latest book, Chris Harkin. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to start at school. When I was 10, I went to a new school. One thing I remember about it was the food. How I hid slabs of liver between two plates. And how the headmistress wished to beat me on the hand for this. My mother put a stop to that. There was one girl I liked, and I told her on the way to the bus. She swung her small square case at me. Its sharp edge cut me over the eye. The blood stained my grey glove black as I rode home on the top deck. The conductor and the doctor laughed. Even my mother smiled when I told the story about how I found out that a girl hits as hard as a boy. Milagrina Dekche. On the beach, my grandmother, who was not my grandmother, smiles at the person behind the camera who sometimes shouted, you are not my mum. Rose wears a fitted jacket, piping round the lapels, hands folded in her lap, handbag on the pebbles, feet in trim low heels, legs crossed at the ankles. Next to her, a small boy, laughing his head off, leans forward on his chair. I hear him and see how Rose looks straight ahead and cannot stop me. Each day before she left, Rose pierced her cloche hat's crown with a long stem pin, chosen from the bowl beneath a mirror by the door to fix the brim about her brow. Hat pins with pearls or sprigs of silver for grip at one end of the stem, sharp enough to kill without a mark except a bead of blood upon the skin. That's my granny. This one you're going to, I'd appreciate it if you could see this one. I'm gonna t I, I went on a school trip a long, long time ago and uh, to Rome. And this is when Bridget Bardot was very famous. So some of you probably never heard of Bridget Bardot. But uh, we certainly had that school in the 60s. And uh, there was a pop song about her. So we're going to sing the chorus. OK, now I'll sing it. You just follow me. Bridgetti Bardot, Bardot. Bridgetti Bardot, Bardot. That's it. Bridgetti Bardot, Bardot. Brigitte Bardo, Bardo. You don't have to do that bit. Brigitte Bardo, Bardo. Okay, you've got it. You've only got to sing it once. Paradise. New pointed tan shoes speckled in the urinal. A window above a street. Below the window, a ledge covered with fag ends. A jetty going out into the lake. Snow capped mountains on the other side. A girl on the jetty facing the mountains. In a bar near the railway station in Rome, a cold Peroni. A young man face down at a nearby table. And a voice from the jukebox singing, Brigitte Bardot, Bardot. Brigitte Bardot, Bardot. Brigitte Bardot, Bardot. Jacob, some early morning when you wake, a ladder of light up the wall where the shutter is still closed. A bird, maybe a dog far off and quiet waves. But what you hear is the sun holding its breath. I'm going to just finish with a little haiku here. 
No, the sun does not go down. The earth turns over and goes back to sleep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, who is now just retreating to his guitar to link to the next poet, who is Denise Bennett, creative writing tutor, the author of several collections, including Parachute Silk. Yes, she is. Graffiti or West Pallant, 
If you haven't, keep an eye unseen. The city's night cat is out again, marking her way down the dark of a street. Her mind is up, simmering, as she steps, flush to a corner, whiskers towards takeaway bags amongst the trousers opposite. But with sudden ears, she spooks, leaves the slither of herself on the wall to stalk the day. And under its street name, still with last night's chip light in her tag, she stands front paw extended, expectant, seen by a child, so tightly held, though succeeds a kick at the tabby iridescence of her face, adds a smudge of street dirt above her nose that seems now to merge with all of the other foot filth, like an aura. <laughs> So, talking of the filth and the fury, here's the Spice Girls. What even does Zig a Zig R mean, really? His voice seems to ask as he reads out the lyrics to Wannabe. Without rhythm, without seeing the lipstick and the tight green dresses, without hearing the close vocal harmonies that demand friendship never ends. Doesn't he know that they also read all to cues to mimic their interviewers, that they swore shared writing credits, that they too were uncontrollable. Are they so very different then? Were Victoria and Emma's Vivian Westwood's and Pink Donuts so dissimilar to Lyndon and Matlock's facts and safety pins? Or is it just that because anarchy went out on vinyl, that somehow one of the on CD isn't for real? <laughs> Meringues, 
and she smiles, but the custard from the yolks you used. I grin and explain the meringue set aside, but I've finished. <laughs> So, having learnt the lessons of custard and meringue, we now move across to an award-winning poet from Hedgehog Press, Pratiba Castle, reading from a triptych of birds and a few loose feathers. <laughs> So there's a Celtic theme that runs through many of the poems in this book. I'm going to start with Padraig, who drove the snakes out of Ireland. At the allotment, Daddy forked the crumbly black earth till the air quaked with anticipation of excess. Me sifting stones in search of treasure. The robin sat, pert, on the lip of the bucket meant to carry spuds or cabbages, the occasional giggle tickle carrot back to placate the mummy. The bird's eye, bright with a lust for worms, his song a crystal cataract of merry, though none of the seeds we sowed ever showed head out of the sly earth, and we saw nothing of the slow worm daddy promised so that his name being Padraig too, I guessed he must be a saint, especially when he himself vanished. Though he turned up months later at the end of school, again and again and again, till I had to tell the mummy where the toys and books came from, and that got me sent off to board at St. Bridget's convent, where the head nun was nice to you if your mammy gave her fruit cake in a tin, bottles of orange linked as sherry, a crochet shawl like frothy cobwebs, none of which my mammy could afford, Padraig having banished more than snakes. Salute, sweet. 
swoops in to dine. The Forsythia is showing shoots. I miss the rain. You'll float across in that cherry cardigan you favored towards the end. Stuck at home, you toasted the hours with a click of needles, knitting socks for friends. I dropped by or phoned less often than I later wished, though that last time I brought the cake. A treat we'd baked together years before. Your strong hand on mine, steering the heartbeat symmetry of the wooden spoon through an anarchy of icing, sugar, butter, splash, or more dependent on the mood of Bewley's coffee. The spill of your song, fizzing the shadows of the basement kitchen as I jammed together sponges open-hearted as your life. The glory of walnut halves tallied one to ten onto my palm to be set with caution on the buttercream glaze. Baked in honor of the day, the sun with its celebratory gleam unseasonable. Tenth of the tenth, the date you and I each entered this world, and that you, even with your sixth Sense, never guessed would be the day you'd leave. And uh, now it's time to introduce Richard Hawtrey, medieval scholar and the author of a fine volume of verse, The Night I Spoke Irish. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, this uh, uh, first uh, poem is in honour of the feisty early 18th century feminist Lady Mary Wortley Montague. I loathe the lewd rake, the dressed foppling despise. Before such pursuers the nice virgin flies, and as of it, as sweetly, in parables told, we harden like trees and like rivers grow cold. That's what she says in her poem, The Lover Abide. And here is my response to it. While reading Lady Montague, the panther in her heart escapes from Rilke's poem to outwit Augustan art. While reading Lady Montague, her atoms and her bees collide in hailstorms racing from the western Pyrenees. While reading Lady Montague, I'm rarely keen to please, as her women dance with Ovid through their metamorphoses. While reading Lady Montague, I don't lose any time electing fresh hypocrisies to skewer with my rhyme. <laughs> <laughs>
finally, two very short poems. Uh, the first, A Thousand Years, is a translation by a uh, 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 13th century uh, German poet uh, um, uh, called Dietmar von Eis. In fact, um, I correct myself, he died in 1171, so he's not 13th century, but so, <laughs> translated from the medieval German. So they get that right. <laughs> it feels a thousand years since I lay in my lover's arms. It can't have been my fault he stumbled up one day, blind to a flower's bloom, deaf to a bird's brief tune. My sorrow sleeps in joy's vast. And finally, First Flight, a poem to my grandmother who was 99. It all began with a pink handkerchief, your father asking how you came by it. I wave it when I'm in the plane, you say, with all a nine-year-old's authority. I've been up twice already. Every day means biplane flying now, and somehow clouds don't settle where they should. You're 99. Your wedding ring, the pilot of your hand, circles familiar fields, comes in to land. Thank you, Richard, who took us on that scholastic tour there. And uh, we're now following that with Christine Rowlands, who is uh, a regular reader at uh, the New Park for the Open Mic and also for the Write Out Loud at Wagtail Coffee. So, Christine, over to you. Professor London. 
And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. Slim, mop-haired man at Brentwood who kept staring at me. Fancy a coffee sometime. Girl in a pink dress. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Really lovely policeman on a motorbike at the traffic lights of Wembley Park and High Street. I really enjoyed our chat and would like to continue it over a coffee, Miss Green Jack. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lives to time thou growest. Twenty-something, naturally beautiful female, wearing black jeans and a black t-shirt, and travelling to Kings Park, Glasgow. My heart skipped a beat. I'd love to know your name and share a coffee with you. White chinos. So long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. <laughs> Christine for taking us round the London Underground and various other places to find out what Shakespeare really meant. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce local author Nicola Goward. Her young adult book, 29 Locks, has been making quite a stir dealing as it does with inner city schools and drugs and county lines. But she's also a poet, as she's going to prove to you now. Nicola.
Watch the shepherd's blood-stained arms, a tangle of cord, a suck, a sweep of orange membrane from the mouth. The lungs shook clear, its mighty red cry an antidote to green. Or in the train to London, slate grey rubble, songs in the shelter to keep spirits from falling, or slept, or screamed, or prayed, or cried, or laughed, or picked up the telephone, or something at least, or something. Impossible to feel another's pain, the walk to the river so easy, the sun warm, long grass, horses grazing and birds, but all the same. She should have waited. Seasons change, tides turn. We should all give it time. The best and worst is still ahead. Take them both together. <laughs> performance rights. The first one with a watery theme. 
earthbound. Take the hazel rods in your hands. Empty your mind. Walk forward slowly with the rods outstretched. But you have your doubts. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't mesh with the world of screens and icons, smart apps and downloads. A nagging voice says, it's all a load of nonsense, isn't it? Like seeking the aid of the gypsy, the seventh child of the seventh child, to smooth away disfiguring blemishes of hand or face. Or taking your place sitting in a faded parlour in a park and all armchair with shabby, time-worn arms while the vicar's wind widow suspends a weight swaying as it strums and circles. Or take another view. You pause on the threshold, remove your shoes, careful not to disturb the karma. Glide in respectful silence to the couch in the consulting room. Lie back while swift needles seek out the ley lines of imbalance. Or you measure out the white powder swirled in purified water, slippery elm to soothe and smooth tidal eddies washing through troubled estuaries. Yes. We have our doubts. The follies, perhaps, of the gullible seeking magical potions and cures, refuseniks of a hectic world, taking everything to extremes, seeking visions and vistas beyond Google and Microsoft and Mac and iPhones and tablets and all the smart stuff which hasn't been invented yet but soon will be. So turn away, just for a moment. Feel the flow of the air. Follow the pattern of your footsteps. Pick up the hazel rods. Hold them loosely in your hands. Empty your mind. Walk forward slowly with the rods outstretched. It seems Unlikely, impossible, a trick, but the rods twitch, and they take your earthbound hands in theirs and point irrefutably down to the cool water welling beneath your feet. was based on a real experience and it's quite weird when it happens like that. This poem begins with a classical tragic heroine facing up to authority and it's dedicated to Greta Thunberg, eco-activist. I will not be silenced. As Antigone creeps into the Theban dawn to sprinkle dust on her murdered brother, as the falling axe silences the finches of Bimsy poplars in Oxford fields, as the social media static blitzes the deliberations of symposia, as the oil wells erupt in flames in the latest hotspot conflict zones, as the flash floods and electric storms drown the riverbanks and coastal plains as bushfires smolder from Adelaide to the green lanes of Wareham Forest, as the frenzied virtual stratospheres obliterate the patterns of play. So the child retreats in shock and awe into the template of darkness, silent until that moment of insight. If I do not take up the burden, if I do not hold high the torch, who will? I will not be silenced while the earth burns.
strains of Bert Yanches and you there, uh, ticking away in the background um, from Chris, who's been linking all the poets. And we come now to our last poet, Melanie Pennicate, chair of the local stanza group, author of many poems and a collection, Feeding Hummingbirds. into his crop, the fishing thread, the bottle top. How can we stop? <laughs> this, I, I had my um, COVID, which I'm sure we all had our COVIDs, <laughs> or are about to. I had my COVID over the solstice, and I was um, bunged into the spare room and all the windows were open, all the curtains were open to let those black things you see on the telly get out. Um, and <laughs> the morning song of the birds was just astonishing at half past four. So this is, this is a sonnet, and I called it COVID Dawn Song, Solstice 2022. Pigeon claps his wings to lift from sleeping. Thrush exclaims, it's you, you did it, did it. Sparrow child sits in the guttering, weeping, lonely for the lofty dark that hid it. Goldfinches ring out their circle charms, jackdaws haw and hack about the ashes. Too monstrous for Leilandai's beckoning arms, old crow flips his finger wings and crashes. Though in this room I'm halfway to the sky, though blackbird pipes revally on his flute, 
and Yaffle rattles brains about his head. Though Mother Sparrow's thoughts now fly, you fly. I lie here motionless, awoken, mute, with windows wide and birds all round my bed. <laughs> website Chichester Poetry you'll find all the info about us at our regular open mic sessions at New Park Centre Chichester. If you look on the South Downs Poetry Festival website you'll find information about events at Midhurst, Arundel, Lewis and here and there over the South Downs. So thank you to the Chichester Fringe for hosting us Thank you to you for coming, and thank you once more to the poets and to Chris, reading and playing.